All right. We talked last week about, um, we're talking about the serial growth of the gospel. And last week we talked about how theologians and church historians for centuries have bought into this concept of an exponential growth theory, thinking that the church just grows as you send out missionaries, as the numbers go out, the numbers grow. Um, and what theologians and historians have began figuring out is the numbers are just not adding up. As Christianity is at a, a standstill in North America, and when I'm talking about North America, we spoke last week, I'm only referring to two-thirds of North America, so in Canada and the United States. Mexico is, because of um, its closer relation to Central America and South America in culture, um, is seeing growth to where is United States and Canada is not. And Europe is at a downslide, right? The church is not growing at all. It is, it's diminishing. So people were saying if exponential growth is factual, this should not be happening. So what happened? People began going to the drawing board and saying, we need a new way to, un to try to understand how Christianity grows and why it grows and why it's not growing in certain regions of the world. So in the last 30 years of academia, we have discovered that Christianity moves not so much in an exponential manner, but in a serial manner. And this is where we get the concept called the serial growth theory. Now remember, this is a theory, 30 years from now, maybe they come up with something else, but this one seems to hold water fairly well. So, the serial growth theory of the gospel, it begins with a place of transmission, right? So, one would say the original place of transmission, we would say, well, that's Jerusalem, right? We can look back to the early days, right? So, you have a starting point, right? And that would be that dot there, say, would be Jerusalem. Now, Jesus said to his followers, hang out in Jerusalem till today, till Pentecost, and then I want you to do what? Go, go get out. Go work. Go spread the gospel throughout the nations, right? So, they are called to go and become missionaries, right? So, what we then have is the growth of Christianity, and for this example, we have Jerusalem, right? And so the center is what we would call the epicenter, kind of like when you would study like an earthquake, right? And then the spiral outward is the growth, right? It, Christianity was exploding, right? It was growing very rapidly, um, it, 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 who knows what was going to happen? But Jesus says, go. And so the message of Christianity then is what we call transmitted. right? So the message is transmitted outward. right? So in this case, we would say outward in the Mediterranean world. And then eventually from the Mediterranean, it begins moving north. And then it goes out, and then it begins going all over the place, right? So the message is transmitted, and so the transmission is moved by missionaries, right? Missionaries are the ones who take the message out. So the original followers, right? Paul, John, Peter, the scores of women that Paul has empowered, right? Lydia, Phoebe, um, uh, the husband team, Priscilla and Aquila, I mean, people are moving Christianity out of Judea, right? Um, the, it, it's amazing because we believe that it's Paul's converts that helped set up the church in Rome. Not even Paul. Not even Peter. But it's his, con his converts beat him to it. <laughs> you know, people are converting and they're saying, well, you know, they're merchants, so, well, I'm going to tell people in Rome about this. And it grows. So what happens? Eventually, a line is crossed, right? And then we would call this a marginal line, right? It's a worldview line, right? It is leaving Judea. It's leaving Jerusalem, and it's crossing cultural boundaries now, places that are 
Not like Jerusalem. Different. It's moving into Gentile areas. So especially when you talk about Jerusalem to Athens, Jerusalem to Rome, Jerusalem into Macedonia, into North Africa, into uh, it, it changes. These are totally different cultures, and something happens. What happens is this. You get a new center. Let's say, for argument's sake, let's say this is Athens. All right? So, what happens now in Athens, right? Paul goes there, and he preaches, and churches are now established, and the gospel is preached fervently and with passion, and now we see something wonderful happen. A new place grows. But now something interesting is happening back home in Jerusalem. And this is now beginning to shrink. So this is why historians are now looking at this and say, hmm, you would think Jerusalem, right, the, the center of it all, well, that's going to be, I mean, sure, I mean, it should be big, but it's not. It's very small compared to some of the other areas. So this happens all across the globe, not just Jerusalem. The only place where this really has not happened really is Vatican City. And we think perhaps <coughs> because there Christianity merged with politics mm -hmm. to form a government. By this, you mean something becomes the center and then fades? It f and it only fades when it is transmitted out. Got it. Right. So, so the old center begins to decline as a new center grows. And we call this diffusion. Right? This is what the, the historians are calling this. They call it diffusion. So as people sit there and scratch their head, we wonder and say, well, why diffusion? Why does this even happen? That makes no sense. Well, we think that the starting point eventually becomes domesticated. Hmm? It begins, the gospel begins to lose its radical edge, its gets sharpness. Diluted. Gets diluted. It gets, people just go to church, yeah. right? Um, the gospel is not preached fervently. And so we feel that, or these Theologians are thinking that as it loses its sharpness and as it becomes domesticated, it begins to shrink. And it begins to shrink because the missionaries are going out and they're starting new points. And when these new points are started, that's when we see the growth happen all over again. So, but we can see this all over the globe, right? The Mediterranean used to be the hotbed of Christianity. Not so much anymore. Then it became, it became Northern Europe, right? No longer Southern Europe, right? Christendom, as we refer to it in the history books. But now we look at Northern Europe, and it's on a decline. Northern Europe spent many years, centuries, sending out missionaries all over the place. Um, and new epicenters grew. I mean, for many years, the United States was one of the leading places that sent out missionaries. But now, all of a sudden, we are at a zero growth, right? So the Christians being born equal to Christians who are passing away, right? So it's a zero rate, right? And we said last week, people said, well, my church is growing. And I said, well, that's fantastic. But unfortunately, that means someone else's church is shrinking. <laughs> this is when you have all the numbers in front of you. You can look at these things. Not to say that statistics are the most important thing, but if you're looking for trends, they're, they're useful, they're, they're helpful. So, but now other areas of the world, we would call like the developing nations, right? South America, Central America, Mexico, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So Africa underneath the Saharan Desert, and Asia. Christianity is utterly exploding. Churches are growing by, it's, it, it's huge. It's huge. And this is why we have a pope that now comes from South America. Because the majority of Christians now live in the Southern Hemisphere. And I wonder if Christianity, if Christians, 
you know, 100 years ago would ever say, would ever think that this would happen. Not like I said last week, it's kind of like talking to someone in 1965 saying, hey, you know, in a few years we're going to be walking on the moon. And I'm sure people would say, yeah, sure. I, I, you know, I watch Flash Gordon too, but, you know, that's not going to happen. Uh, so, but yet, here it is. And it has happened, right? And so the developing nations are seeing an enormous growth in Christianity. So we have to understand that when this message is transmitted, the gospel, it is sharp. It is counter-cultural many times, just like it was when it first came here, or it first came to Northern Europe, or it first came to Southern Europe. It was very much so. I mean, when you read the Bible, and we say, ah, you know, you hear these things that Paul said over and over again for 2,000 years, but imagine hearing him for the first time. Imagine thinking about this for the first time. It's huge. It's, it's, it's a totally new concept. Totally new concept that is being offered to the world. So the gospel is not domesticated. Um, the gospel is sharp and it is powerful. And it is when it becomes domesticated and people become so comfortable that they're worried about other things rather than the gospel, like in many churches... I uh, can't tell you how many times you hear about churches splitting over the color of carpet. <laughs> True story. Yeah. I'm not, this is not, <laughs> not, not, not a fabrication. Um, so, when we think about this model, when we think about this new place growing and this original place shrinking, which it does, we must think about what is transmitted, because this is very important. What is transmitted is never pure religion. It is never pure, purely the gospel. Why is that? What else comes with the message? All the baggage we have. All the baggage we have. Very good. Mm. The baggage, culture, cultural worldviews. Yeah. It happens. It happens. Um, some of the earliest missionaries who went to China were trying to make the the Chinese people dress like they dressed. It makes no sense. Why would you do that? Right? Why would you teach it in your language when you should be teaching it in whose language? Their language. Their language. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, the gospel is never transmitted purely. So when the gospel left Jerusalem, think about the Jerusalem council telling Paul what to do. <clears throat> well, you don't have to do these things. Well, you don't make them get circumcised, but... Mm, Ooh, ooh, uh, don't eat strangled meat, you know. Don't eat meat that, you know, has... has uh, of course, sure. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So they were trying to have some stipulations to it. They, they gave Paul, you know, they're the CEOs, and Paul is out there doing the work, and I, you can almost see Paul going, ah, <laughs> why? Just let me do my job, right? So, but as Christianity first moved out of this region, it was very Jewish, as it should be. Jesus was a Jew. All his followers, original followers, were Jewish. Paul was Jewish. Um, he had a different skill set, but he was still Jewish, right? He was a Pharisee. So they thanked, they, they thought like Jews. So the Christianity that they transmitted had a very Jewish flavor. Now, Christianity starts growing in the Mediterranean world. North Africa, right? Greece, Macedonia, Italy, Spain, Gaul. Now, when they start sending out Christianity, do you think it has a Jewish flavor to it? Mm -hmm. You might have some remnant, remnants of that Jewish flavor, but now it's going to have a, a different flavor, right? A Roman flavor, a Greek flavor, right? A Galatian, right? Wherever Timothy is from or where Luke is from. And so they can, the philosophies of the, of mm. the Greeks and stuff, so it's not yeah. the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. So th different things are happening now. Not only is that, but examples begin to change. Even with Paul. Jesus is all about agrarian examples. Paul says, no, think about a race. Mm -hmm. He's using now uh, examples that people would understand in the Mediterranean world. So it begins to spread and think and change. When it goes to North Europe, Northern Europe, it now has the... the the baggage of Southern Europe, but now when Northern Europe begins transmitting it out, it's going to look very different. When we sent it out, 
it looks very different. And you can now when you start looking and going back, you can see how it has changed. Christianity in North America looks very different than Christianity does in the Middle East. And Christianity in North America looks very different than Christianity in Mexico. Very different. Very different. One is not wrong and one is not right. It is what it is. It is merged with a different worldview. Because Christianity is not a religion or faith that says you have to do this, 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 this. If we celebrate communion with Welches and pieces of bread and maybe somewhere in Asia they might use um, rice cakes or balled up rice and sake, which one is right, which one is wrong? Sake. Like yeah, you like sake. <laughs> 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 Neither, right? It's, it's, all, it's all the same. It's people taking ownership of what has been entrusted to them, right? And this is one of the beautiful things about Christianity as it has spread now, which no longer Christendom, we, we, we now talk about Christianity as world Christianity or global Christianity because it's, it's very different from Christendom, right? Europe no longer makes the rules, right? It's now global. Christianity is global. So it always takes on the form of the culture that transmits, transmits the message. Now, how does the other side grow? That's a great question. The other side must embrace it first, just like we talked about China last week. And as missionaries are there transmitting the gospel message, it grew very slowly. It was growing, but, you know, very slowly. Um, before China closed its doors to the West, um, or Asia itself, not just China, 22 million Christians, right, in Asia. When China opened its doors and when Asia be, uh, began to lack some of these rules allowing missionaries to come and for us to see what the church now looks like, 282 to 313 million. And that's from, so in, in 1900, 22 million. 95 to 2000, 282 to 313 million Christians. That is huge. And yet there were no missionaries allowed to go. Why the growth? Because it is now their religion. And it grew as their religion. They took ownership. They took ownership. The ministers now are native. The missionaries are native. The deacons and the elders, everyone now is Chinese or Korean. And this is how Christianity grows. It must no longer be seen as an outside religion, but as a religion embraced by the people who live there. And this, and China is a beautiful example of this, of how the gospel has grown. It's no longer seen as an outside force. It's now embraced as Chinese. And it's ministers that come from there. Right? And so it must be embraced. And once it is embraced, hybridization takes place. Right? It, it then becomes part of their culture, so now it looks different. Because it now takes on their flair, their worldview, their ideals. Right? If you go to a, a church where you have different languages, a different languages spoke primarily, you might not be able to understand everything that goes on in that service. You'll be able to recognize certain things, even mm -hmm. if you can't understand a language. You can recognize certain things, like if communion, even if the communion looks different, you still know it's communion. Hmm? <coughs> so different things are taking place. Yeah, we went to church in uh, Canada years and years ago in Montreal. It was a Catholic mm. church. It was all in French. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Except for the offering. They did that in both. <laughs> I love it. They, they're, they're smart, you know? they made sure everyone understood whether you were English or French. You knew what it was time for. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Christianity always goes through a translation into its new culture, and it always becomes a hybrid. And what that means is it, it picks up parts of the culture that it enters once it is embraced as their own. And this is why even in any church it's important for people to have to feel ownership of it. Whether the faith 
or the church itself, right? When you have new members, it's important that new members feel ownership, that they belong here, that this is, this is theirs too, just like we feel it is ours. Because when you feel that ownership, then it be, that bond becomes very strong. That bond becomes very strong. And it's the same thing with the gospel. Once people feel ownership of it, then it's saying, this belongs to us. This is our faith. It's not just the faith of the people who gave it to us. But no, now it belongs to us, too. Yeah. Um, and so, when we think about it, um, Christianity in the Western world, uh, in non-Western areas, it's interesting because it is in such, it's in a growing stage, it's not controlled by uh, bureaucratic institutions. So the church looks very different right now um, in areas of the world where it is growing. It's growing so fast, people haven't had the chance yet to do that. Eventually it will happen. I'm, I'm almost, pa, I would, I'm, if I was a gambling man, I'd bet on it. That one day it will happen. Um, just like in the beginnings of the church in Europe, there were no bureaucratic institutions. It was just a church, right? But after a while, well, we've had it for a while. Might as well start <laughs> making some guidelines of what you can do and can't do. Um, and this is what happens. And eventually it will happen in the areas where it's growing as well. So when you think about countries who used to lead in missions, right? The United States used to be in that category. The United States is no longer in that category. We've been bumped out. Does anyone know the two leading nations that send out the most missionaries? Korea. Korea is one of them. Excellent. Korea is one of them. And the other one is in South America. Big country. Brazil? Brazil. Brazil and Korea, well, specifically South Korea, um, are the two countries <laughs> that send out the most um, missionaries. And where are they going? They're going China. to Europe. They probably need to come here. Probably. And they are. They are. Yeah. And they are coming to yeah, North America. They are coming to the areas where Christianity is floundering. So here is the interesting thing. And this is the part of it that, that should make people excited rather than um, anxious or um, scared. Is that... If we now think of Christianity in a serial growth manner rather than an exponential way, that it just is going to keep coming around. But when the gospel comes back to North America, it's not going to look anything like it looked when it came to us from Europe. It's going to look very different. Because now it's going to take on the flair of, whether it be uh, South Korea or Brazil, it's going to look nothing like it looked like. Because now it's going to have their culture attached to it. Their understanding of the gospel attached to it. It's not wrong. It's never wrong. It's different. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's how the gospel has moved in different areas and how it is spread. And so when we think about the serial growth theory, the exciting piece is, what's the gospel going to look like? when it begins to be transmitted to us because it's coming back it's going to look different it's going to look different and so what this means for the church is well if the majority of Christians are living in the southern hemisphere and in Asia this is where your power seats are going to be and not just for the Protestant church but also for the Roman Catholic church yeah and the proof is in the Pope we currently have. He is not from Europe. He is European. <laughs> he is European by uh, ancestry. Right? I think he's Italian. Is his family was Italian, but he's not Italian. He's as much Italian as I'm Italian. I'm, I'm, I'm American. Yeah. Even though all my ancestors come from Italy, all his ancestors came from Italy. He's not Italian, right? So this is proof. Right? And you will, we will continually see popes that are now chosen from the Southern Hemisphere, from Asia. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, it's exciting. So, the church needs to stop running around like Chicken Little thinking the sky is falling, because the sky is not falling. It's just 
a little bleak here, but the church is doing extremely well um, in other places. Yes? Except I saw something yesterday that Islam is going to take over Christianity as the number one religion by 2050. I heard the same thing. But, yes. Yeah, that's still up in the air. But it, doesn't, but it doesn't mean that Christianity is, and I've heard the same, I've heard the same report, um, but Christianity is still growing. Right. Now, uh, I, last number I heard was like 2.2 billion out of seven. Is that still it's, a good number? Yes, Christianity is still the largest religion in the world by far. Um, Islam is moving very close, behind, and it probably will pass up. Um, it's just need to have more babies. Yeah, it's just because that's why. It's not like they, they have a strong thing. Yeah. The <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Any questions before we let you go? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll